two, and three. We are now recording. Well, I find it absolutely amazing to discover that we're already in September of 2018. Um, we've done a whole series of shows this year. Some have been absolutely fantastic. Sadly, um, one of our previous guests tragically died of a heart attack um, well, just over a month ago, um, uh, Brian Murray. And if any of you watched the show, you will know it was absolutely wonderful. But sadly, as always with us, the Archons took over and we had a little problem with the recording. But Brian was um, an incredible guy, um, very, very well known, uh, both nationally and internationally, um, as a theatre producer and also a theatre director. Um, so my, my comments go out to his family at this sad time as well. Uh, and I do suggest if anybody wants to check out the, the interview I did with him, please do. But my apologies for the sound. It was beyond our control. But there are some fascinating anecdotes there as well. Um, today, I'm particularly excited today. I'm particularly excited today because not only have we have one guest, but we have an audience behind him as well, which is really good. And uh, if they start cheering and chanting and everything, that's even better uh, because it uh, actually makes it far more interesting. But um, our guest is, is Dr. Mats Barus. Uh, um, and I'm presuming I'm pronouncing that correctly, but he'll probably correct me later if need be. But he's a professor in the Department of Psychology at King's University College and is the adjunct professor of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities at Western University. This is in Canada. Um, in fact, they're all sitting there in London, Ontario, the other London, as we call it. Uh, he has expertise in consciousness studies. Professor Barrows teaches courses about consciousness and altered states of consciousness. His current research includes the development of a flicker theory of consciousness, as well as laboratory studies in human-machine interaction with random event generators. He's the author of six books, 46 papers, and 22 reviews, and has given 93 presentations at conferences and universities around the world. He's an associate editor and journal of the Scientific Ex Journal of Scientific Exploration, and a member of a number of professional societies, including the New York Academy of Science and the Society for Consciousness Studies, which he co-founded. Wow, what, a, what an introduction and what a guest this guy is gonna be. Now, their new book, he has written a new book with uh, Julia Mossbridge, which is called Transcendent, Transcendent Mind. And it is absolutely an amazing read. This book is so needed in the present worldview because it has probably now become my favorite book on the subject. Uh, and I've been reading and I've read hundreds and hundreds of books over the years. But this one resonates with me because of the areas that both Bruce and Mossbridge focus in on. Now, you'll be interested to know that in December, Dr. Julia Mossbridge will be joining us for this, this, um, this particular show. But what we'll do is we'll focus in some areas today and move in from there. Now, Dr. Bruce, the first thing I need to know is, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Sure. Yeah, that sounds good. Oh, good. I, okay. I don't okay. correct people when they pronounce my name. I don't worry okay. About it. What is its origins, by the way? Where, where is your um, family from? Uh, my ethnic background is Latvian. Uh, I was born in Leeds, England. Uh, brought to Canada when I was two, before I was two. And um, so my first name, Imans, is a very uh, traditional Latvian name. My last name, Baruš, turns out some of my great grandfathers came from Serbia. So it's actually a Serbian last name. So Baruš. That's what I thought. I thought yeah. that. I thought it sounded Serbian. And I, I thought, or Croatian or something, or something Balkan. So I was intrigued about, and of course, the image you have on your Facebook site as well is an intriguing one. And I was thinking, is that identical? Who is that? Who is that? You know, the picture you have on Facebook? Um, that uh, was a drawing that my best friend Zintar Smejols made. He was an artist and he made it around 1974. Right. Interesting. Okay, right. Without further ado, let's get started then. So the first thing I'm, I'm always interested in is, is how you became interested in the subject you write about. What is it? Because I've read many of your papers and your papers are, are, are fascinating in themselves. But what is it that's actually made you move into this interesting direction of psychology? Um, I think that at some point as a teenager, I realized that we needed to look beyond conventional ways of thinking about things in order to understand what the point of life was and what was actually going on. 
and that led me into areas of interest that that are usually regarded as being spiritual and in fact one of the very first books i read as a teenager was houston smith's the great religions of man which has now been retitled to get the word man out of the title but it really affected me because it made me realize that there were world religions that had a very deep um apparently a very deep understanding of the nature of reality that we really are missing uh in the west and so that's really what started it okay so so, so moving on then the new book i mean we can touch on a little bit more of your research but i'm really interested in the new book because i think it starts with the most powerful I think of all I've ever seen of the um, the taking apart of the president the present materialist reductionist scientific worldview, and the way in which you actually take each 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 belief system of the the, the materialist reductionist worldview, and then you show how modern science has actually disproved that position. Um, I'd like you to a little bit expand upon that because I think a lot of the people listening in or a lot of people watching this would be interested to know how you do that. So if you could actually go through a little bit of how you take that apart and how you say, this is the present paradigm. This is where the present paradigm is proving itself to be redundant. I think um, I've had a lot of practice doing that. I've been teaching for 31 years and many of the students in my classes are materialists, of course, coming in. And they're coming in from all disciplines in my classes. So I'm used to having to speak to a very wide range of different ideas and beliefs about reality. Uh, so I've made these arguments over and over again for a very long time. And so I think that in the book together with Julia, we kind of, kind of managed to come up with a really incisive and well-masticated version of all of that. Uh, I, I think the second thing I want to say is that there is no single definition of materialism. Materialists are also very reluctant to give definitions of materialism because then it can be attacked and they don't want it attacked. Um, and uh, and it's very, very, very difficult to give a definition of materialism that isn't already self-annihilating, in effect. But we use four common, sort of, well, not, not necessarily common, but we use four yeah, common and uh, empirically derived definitions of materialism, and then in each case show why they don't work. And I think the important thing there to, to understand there is that materialism is not the same as science. Science is a, an epistemological endeavor. It's how we know things. And this was the big revolution in the medieval ages that we weren't just gonna believe people. We weren't just gonna believe what somebody wrote somewhere, what somebody told us. We were actually going to go out and investigate. And we were going to acquire empirical information about something. And that that was going to be the basis of our knowledge, not some kind of you know, statements that people were making. And so I think that for me, like I'm, I'm a scientist. I've been a scientist. I believe in science. I think science is, is the way to go. I think science can lead us to the truth. Of course, one of the things that happens as you start practicing science, you realize that it also has to do with the internal world and subjective states. And so it needs to be modified appropriately for the investigation of such internal states. Uh, but having sort of embraced science and, and in following science, um, what you find is that these theories, and theories get proposed all along in science, all kinds of theories, and they, they last for a while and then they get overturned because there's better data, there's better methods of investigation, and so on. Um, and, and, and so getting stuck on a particular theory is not really, you don't really want to get stuck because you, you want to always be moving where the uh, exploration is taking you. The problem is that we got stuck at materialism, which is a theory. 
it's a and and as Julia and I point out, there are four different sort of versions that we take on uh, of materialism. And science has moved on and shown that those versions are false. And yet the entire, not the entire, but much of the academic structure uh, is clinging to those versions of materialism as though they were some kind of religious edicts that we're not allowed to question or approach or... So does that help? Yeah, no, that does very much so. Because I think your use, which particularly there were two things that you actually brought up. There was Hempel's dilemma. And I thought that was a very intriguing critique of modern science. If you just explain very quickly what Hempel's dilemma is uh, to the, uh, the, the, the viewers, because uh, it's quite a powerful point you make in terms of that. Um, if I can remember it. Okay, it's the one whereby you have the circumstances whereby all scientific theories to date have all come out of each other, you know, the theory of, of, of scientific revolutions. So therefore it is logical to conclude that this science will also have its issues because it cannot, be an, it cannot explain everything. And the way in which science just seems to replace itself, there's no scientific worldview that's ever been 100% correct to date. I think that where um, Hempel's dilemma or Hempel's arguments are arguments against the idea that somehow um, you can define materialism in terms of what physicists think or say. And, and so that's, I mean, that's one way of getting around the actual definitions of materialism. You say, well, well, we give up, we give up. It's whatever it is that physicists tell us that the world is like is what the world is going to be like, and that's materialist. And so, the problem there is that, of course, relying on any theory that physics has come up with, I mean, I just finished saying materialism, you know, and its other incarnations or its other versions um, doesn't work anymore. It's been disproven. So we're just going to keep disproving things. So to, to fasten a definition or a um, sort of a, 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 an inherent belief that somehow this is going to last forever on a particular version of how we understand the world coming out of physics is simply misguided. I mean, it's, it can't work. And then the other part, the sort of, the other horn sort of of this problem is that if you, if you say, well, it's, no, no, we're, we're not talking about physics now, we're talking about the ideal physics when we've got everything figured out. And so the, the point there is, well, we don't have everything figured out. And, how do you know what that's going to look like? We have no idea what that's going to look like when everything is figured out, if that's even possible. And so to sort of insist that, that it's what physicists tell us, and, that, and, the, and then the, the, the part that I really like is when the philosophers start telling the physicists what they should find or what they're going to find so that their ideas about materialism can remain intact. And, and like now what's happening, you're telling physicists what they're supposed to find. And then they go, no, 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 of course, we're not doing that. Well, they are. This is usually called promissory materialism, that you're mm -hmm. promising that the materialism will hold up under any future investigation. The problem is that it hasn't already held up to present investigation. So the point that it's going to hold up in some kind of future investigation is kind of like, it, it just doesn't make sense. I mean, you can see now, you know, that really what's happening here is dogmatism that people are simply clinging to an outmoded and, and old way of thinking about things because they're, they're, they're incapable of letting go of those structures, of those ways of thinking about things. The other thing which is, you know, as having been involved in the physics community, um, physicists don't speak with a uniform voice. There is no single physics theory. I mean, one example I give in one of my other books is there's disagreement among physicists whether 17 kilo electron volt neutrinos exist or not. Mm. Well, how can you disagree about that? It's matter. It's either there or it isn't. How can some people say, oh, it's there, and other people say, no, it isn't? So, I mean, even something very, very basic like that, you're having problems with. Well, let's let's move on into, you know, like this this sort of subparticle zoo that's come out in the last you know 50 60 years i mean it's crazy 
I mean, and, and nobody knows whether the standard theory is true or not. They hope it is. They think it might be. The, the evidence at a Large Hadron Collider is, I mean, and that, that whole process itself is a, is a very um, um, constrained, well, constrained, it's, it's an artifactual process. Like it's a very, uh, there's a lot of censorship, self-censorship and so on involved in that entire process. I mean, how do you decide if these swirls are supposed to be something or not? I mean, so, so the kind of, even the kind of evidence and the evidence gathering is all being questioned. The, the standard theory is like, nobody actually likes it because it's pretty messy. Like the, the simplest solution to fitting in the Higgs boson is, is messy, but it's the easiest patch up to the standard theory. So, I mean, physics itself, when you get into it and you start talking to physicists, I mean, there's, there isn't all that much agreement and, and their fundamental aspects of, you know, the, the theories that physicists have proposed that don't match with one another and that don't work and all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So to sort of, for people who don't know any physics to sort of point the finger and say, well, physicists are going to tell us, well, which one? And we have already had lots of physicists tell us that matter is not primary, that matter is secondary. So, you know, Henry Stapp, for example, um, is is one uh, such uh, very uh, renowned a renowned physicist who has who has made that contention for a long time. So, so who are you going to listen to? Because I think your points there are very very well made. Because the issue isn't it? You know, when Eccles came across his idea of promissory materialism, you know, and the idea that we don't understand things now, we can't we can't explain how consciousness comes as some form of epiphenomenon from um, from physical states within the brain. We have no idea about that. We have no understanding of, of what we mean when we talk about subatomic particles. I mean, I was intrigued, and I'm, I'm thinking about writing a new book on this. The idea, do you remember E.E. E. Raby, the, the quantum physicist, once turned around and said when they found the neutrino, and he turned around and he said, who ordered that? And it almost seems as if we think about subatomic particles, and suddenly they pop out of hyper-reality, and suddenly they're there to fulfill our meaning of, of how we understand the world to be. Now, I was interested that you mentioned Henry Stapp because of course we then move into the area of the idea of this is some form of simulation. And in some way, the relationship between consciousness and physical reality are far closer than, than we've ever really understood before. And it comes down again to one of the points you made, which I thought was brilliant, was using Leibniz's principle of sufficient reason for the idea, you know, of, well, why is consciousness, why is self-referential consciousness evolved? What is the, why should, it, it's not needed. There is no real need for consciousness within the universe, but it has happened. And again, you cite a person I've done an event with, Raymond Tallis, and his, his argument about neuroscientism and the idea that neuroscience seems to think it has all the answers. It's hubris writ large. And I think this is where your book has its strength because it starts asking really, really fundamental questions about what the scientific model is. Now, in terms of your position on, 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 on Chalmers' idea of the hard problem of physics, um, what's, what's your ideas and thoughts on that? The hard problem of consciousness, you mean? Sorry, say again? The hard problem of consciousness? Yes. Yeah. You said physics. What did I say? Physics, the hard problem of physics. Oh, yeah, did I? Yeah, the hard problem of consciousness. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, that's true. But what's your ideas on, on Chalmers and his approach to all this? Well, I think, um, uh, so just, just to back up a bit, because this has to do directly with that, to what you just finished saying. Here's the strategy that the materialists have. First, they strip, the physicists strip reality of, anything that has to do with meaning or subjective states or uh, what we call qualia, raw feels, the, the sense that anything is going on at all. They strip all of that out of it. Now we've got a theory of reality, of the universe. Physicists are going to tell us we have a theory of reality. And of course, they're all over the place with it, but fine. And then they go, oh, now we're going to get 
out of this stuff, which we just finished stripping all these things out of it, we're now going to put it back in. We're going to say that if you do enough of these things that have none of it, you're going to get some of it. And that is a completely absurd research agenda. I mean, it's, 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 it's sheer nonsense. First, you make sure that no vestige of it is left so that you can have a perfectly objective physical world. And then you're going to say, oh, and out of this perfectly physical objective world, we're going to get all these, you know, meaning, qualia, you know, all these, all these delicious things out of it. Well, well, you just finish taking them out. So that, that argument in the first place is just crazy. But this is exactly uh, David Chalmers' point. Now, he called it the hard problem. Of course, it was around before that. You mentioned Sir John Eccles at the Villa Olmo conference in 1964. Uh, there's an interchange between himself and Savage in which there's this, and th this display on what it is that you mean by consciousness and what you're really talking about when you talk about consciousness. And what, what's, what, you, what you want to be talking about or what the important thing that you want to be talking about when you're talking about consciousness is the aspect of our experience that has that is experience as experience in other words that has qualia that has these qualitative features to it that it feels like something is going on that it's that, that it's happening or what um julia and i called in the book existential qualia that that you you feel as though their existence is going on and that this is sort of what i've given as um consciousness three as the as the definition of consciousness three, or one of the definitions of consciousness. Do you have your definitions there, Jordan? <laughs> Jordan's wearing a shirt with the definitions on it. Right. We made that up. We had a consciousness conference last spring, and we made up sweatshirts for ourselves. And Jordan <laughs> came up with the design for it. Excellent. We need to, we'll need to post that up. We'll post that up later or something, you know, so that they look, can people buy these? Can people buy them? Are they online? <laughs> yes. Jordan's nodding. Yes. They're not online. No, we just made a couple for ourselves. Oh dear. Oh dear. But we'll talk to him about it. Okay. But the, but the point here is that the point here is that what, because David Chalmers was sufficiently famous as a philosopher, does the philosophy of mind, has an introductory uh, philosophy textbook on the philosophy of mind and so on, he actually stuck it to the academic community and made them realize that this is what we're talking about. Before that, those of us who were working in the area of consciousness, I mean, it was perfectly clear to us that this was the issue. Um, and and but nobody else was listening like it was really you know 1994 that everybody started to listen and to pay attention and consciousness suddenly became big and that this issue was raised that and basically this same issue that when you're looking at something like these subjective states they don't look like anything like the material world around us so there's a gap there's an explanatory gap that's david chalmers point there's an explanatory gap here. We have all these theories of physical matter, um, and then we have, like, on top of them, we've got writing on these, these uh, neuroscientific theories and these cognitive theories and so on and so forth, but, but none of them get at, get at what this is, like what this is that's going on. And then, as you point out, Leibniz's principle, so why is it there? I mean, for all these materialists, it would be so much easier if the universe ran in the dark. That's how we usually talk about it, it runs in the dark. But it doesn't, there's this light there. Where did the light come from? What's it doing there? Why is it there? Why is it necessary? And so like the arguments that I've read from various cognitive psychologists and scientists and so on, it's, it's all this kind of like um, distraction and all the rest of it. Like they can't really answer that. Like there's no reason for it. If you have a mindless universe, there's no point, there's no, you know, it's, it's an embarrassment. It's, it's, um, it's a problem. It's, it's, you know, you just wish that it would go away. And the way you deal with it usually is to say, well, I don't think about that. Lee Smolin does that in his book. He says, I got all kinds of questions about consciousness. He goes, I don't think about that. I don't talk about it. 
I know it's amazing, isn't it? I mean, when you read work like the eliminative materialists, like Daniel Dennett and the Churchlands, and you read Dennett, and Dennett's book, Consciousness Explained, is, is a whole exegesis trying to actually prove that the author of the book doesn't exist as a kind of an entity that has any kind of self-referential existence. Now, to me, this is, this is crazy. This is the one thing that we all know with absolute certitude is that we are something perceiving something. And this is obvious, and it is so obvious, it's self-evident. Of course, we have the problem of you may be an automaton, you may be um, a zombie, that, that you may just be something that is pretending to be alive or pretending to be self-referential. But if you know from your own experience that you experience things. Now, one of the things you touched upon there two or three times, which I think I'd like you to expand upon, is just the term qualia. What do you mean when you use the term qualia? And why is qualia so mysterious and so difficult to explain using normal cognitive models of consciousness? Okay. Um, let, me just, let me just go back to this point, the point about um, Dan Dennett. And I, I think that uh, it's very... Uh, okay, so I never read Consciousness Explained. Um, because he was just basically repeating what he'd said before. I read, I read what he said before that very carefully. And by the way, he changed his, his theories of consciousness um, also. Like they're not, they haven't been stable, they have changed. Yeah, he had the multiple drafts, didn't he, for a time, you know, and everything. Well, before that, it was the printer, com uh, it was the computer printout mechanism. Oh, well. yeah. Sorry, I interrupted, I shouldn't, sorry. That was in, uh, that was in Brainstorms, in his book, Brainstorms. So, I mean, so the first thing about Dan Dennett is, and uh, actually the first conversation I had with Shamari was about Dan Dennett, um, is that he had the courage to say, let's talk about consciousness. And to, and to bring it to the attention of philosophers. And he was a sufficiently noteworthy philosopher that other philosophers started paying attention. So I think that that was really an important thing that uh, Dan Dennett did. And he didn't want to run away from the problem. He acknowledged that there was this explanatory gap that David Chalmers later would call the hard problem. Uh, so he acknowledged it. But when you read what he says very carefully, you see that he always just very quickly slips over from the subjective view to the objective view. It just, without even, without even, it's as though, it's as though nobody noticed. Yeah. You know, like, he didn't notice, but I noticed. Uh, and so, and then he's suddenly there. Now, I think what, um, something that happened at one of the conscious conferences at the University of Arizona many years ago. Um, okay, this, this, this requires a little explanation. So, you've got the speaker standing at a podium, and there are these lights um, on the podium to notify the speaker when the speaker's running out of time. So David Chalmers brought a hairdryer down. This is in a hotel. So he brought, well, he brought the hairdryer from the hotel. This is actually, the auditorium was at the University of Arizona. Uh, he brought the hairdryer down. And he said, okay, we have a machine here for detecting consciousness. And then, you know, when the green light goes, he points it at someone and, and turns the green light on. He goes, yep, got it, got it, got it, got it. And then he, then he goes, Where's Dan? Where's Dan? He points it out into the audience. He turns a red light on. Okay, this explains everything. <laughs> I thought it was funny. Like, we all laughed our heads off. It was such a joke. But I'm not sure it is. I'm not sure it is anymore. Because um, since that time, I've studied um, people with DID more, people with dissociative identity disorder. Mm -hmm. And you ask them, like, like you say, so... So is there, is there a self? Like, do you have a sense of the self? And they give you this kind of like blank stare and they say, well, I, I learned how to use the word I and me when I was a child. So now you go like, wait a minute, do they even have this sort of sense of self? Or is, is this someone in whom this is missing or in some way distorted or in some way inaccessible to their metacognition? And, and it made me start to realize that the variations on what can happen to a person consciously are much greater than we ordinarily think. And that it's possible that either Dan Dennett doesn't have it, which is why he can talk like this, or 
he, he's not aware of it. He can't find it. He can't access it. And in fact, in brainstorms, he says, well, how do I know my theory is correct? Because I look at myself, I apply it to myself, and I find that it works perfectly well. And so, of course, then I turn that around and I go, well, yeah, I apply it to myself and it doesn't work. So your theory is useless. Okay, so it, basically what he was doing there also was giving people permission to, to have sub, a subjective science, basically. And, and chapter seven in our book, as you know, is about subjective science and how to, how to do science incorporating subjective aspects into it. So I think that, that that's kind of the first part. I think it's very important to realize that people's experience of their subjective self are not uniform. Actually, at the other end of the spectrum, um, uh, one of my um, students has been studying uh, alumni from the Finders course. So Finders course is a course that Jeffrey Martin set up to shift people into permanent transcendent states of consciousness. I know this sounds like, how do you do that? Well, <laughs> we've been studying these people and the key feature that seems to be a part of their psyche is that there's no self. So that the self is attenuated, self-talk is attenuated. Now, mind you, qualia seem to still be there, but the self is gone or appears to be gone. And so the reason I'm raising this is to say that the inner dynamics of our psyche are much more complex than we ordinarily think. And so like your point that sort of Dan Dennett just, he's missing the obvious. Mm, maybe he's not. Maybe he's actually onto the complexity of what is going on inside, but he assumes this is the problem with philosophers. They're always working from a, um, from a sample of N equals one, right? Like in psychology or in medical science, like, you know, how big is your sample? One. <laughs> and so you assume that everybody's like you. And that everybody's experience is like yours. And you can't find this, so therefore nobody can find it. Well, of course, that's absurd. It doesn't make any sense logically. But that's kind of the, that's what philosophers have done for a long time. They just assume that what it is that's going on for them is what's going on for everyone. And because they don't experience this, then, well, too bad. Nobody else does. They don't even think about that. <laughs> so I think that... Um, I think it's important to remember that, that there is this variation and some of it is now being induced through these training programs like Jeffrey Martin's Finders course, where people are shifting and changing their actual, the shape of their experience, so to speak. Okay, so you asked about qualia. So what are qualia? And this is a term that's been used in the philosophy of mind and now has become used, of course, a lot in consciousness studies and when people talk about consciousness. And the usual sort of translation of it or way of um, describing it is to say that it's raw feels, raw feels. It's the way something feels without any qualities or characteristics attached to it. Um, now, sort of if, if you, and, and it's, it, starts actually from uh, the, a discussion of perception, right? So, so typically like, okay, so, uh, you know, you've got the Mary sees red thing, which I'm sure you've heard over and over again in the philosophy of mind. Like Mary is a neuroscientist, and, but she's colorblind. And, um, you know, she can't see red, but she knows everything about red. She knows all the neural connections and all the biochemistry and all of them, everything about red. Um, so in what sense, like, what is she missing? Well, she's missing the experience. She doesn't know what the experience is. Um, the other analogy, which is used over and over again is childbirth. You know, uh, can men talk about childbirth if they haven't given birth to a child? Well, sorry, no, because there's an experience attached to it. And only certain people have had that actual experience. What does it feel like to have a baby? Right? So... So there you're sort of starting to get at, so what is it that we're looking for here? And 
Now we come back to the point you were raising about Dan Dennett, that if you don't have that, or if you can't find that in your own experiential stream, or you can't identify that subjectively, then you don't know what we're talking about. It's like, you, you can logically talk about it, but you don't really, but you don't understand it. Of course, this is Searle's famous Chinese room argument that, mm -mm. you know, you, anyway, well, going into it, but the, the point being that, that in order for somebody to know what you're talking about when you use the word qualia, they need to have some, because otherwise they'll have a reference for it, but it'll be a vacuous reference because they won't know, well, what's that about? They don't know what it's about because they don't experience it. It's about something. And you can have a placeholder for something that you don't know anything about. We did that all the time, of course. Um, but, but that's all it's going to be. It's going to be a placeholder. So to really understand what you mean by quality, you sort of have to investigate yourself and see if there are any there. And then, well, is, well, maybe this is what they mean when they use the word quality. Maybe this is the kind of thing they're talking about. And so now, one of the things that's happened over the years is I talk about this, and, and that's sort of the third definition of consciousness or fourth actually but it's labeled consciousness three like when you break down to what what people mean when they use the word conscious that's one of the things they want to talk about that's one of the one of the things that people ascribe to the word consciousness are these uh are these qualia but in particular okay now we're extracting it out of the perceptual domain into just the purely experiential domain and so it's not the redness of the red it's just that there's a sense of something going on. In other words, existence is happening. It's not not happening, it's happening. It feels like it's happening. And so now we, we modify you know, the word quality and we use the term existential quality. I've started doing that the last several years. Talk about that as existential quality, existence. There's a sense that things exist, that reality exists. Of course, in the materialist point of view, not only is that not necessary and an embarrassment and all the rest, but there isn't any of that. It's missing. Nothing feels like it exists. It just does. It's just there. So it's, it's kind of like placing that, placing this existential qualia at the center of the inquiry and saying, okay, what is this? Where did this come from? What does it have to do with everything else? What do we know about it? And then to rigidly hold on to materialism as you do that, is obviously, you know, fool's errand. Wow, that was absolutely fascinating because there were so many points there and I, I keep forgetting that we're actually doing an interview here because I keep thinking, God, there's so many themes I can pick up on here and want to discuss with you and maybe at some stage we can do that in the future privately. Because I was thinking, for instance, this, this idea of, of a, a loss of idea of self and the idea that you can become almost like non-dual in the sense that you lose your sense of self into the kind of collective unconscious or what Jung would call the collective unconscious, whatever we want to term it. And you lose yourself in that. But I was more intrigued about your idea about Daniel Dennett and, and the limited materialists, the idea that they, they cannot think that way because their brains don't work or their, their, their psyche doesn't function in that way. Because a few years ago, I'm a qualified, qualified psychometrician, and I used to uh, do psychometric profiling on pilots for, uh, for, uh, for uh, uh, um, my airline. And there was one pilot I did the 16 PF on, and it came out quite clearly that this guy could not tolerate criticism. So when I brought him into my office and I started to explain, and I gave him all the general positive points. And then I said, but it does seem that you cannot tolerate criticism. And he stood up and he banged the table and he said, how dare you say I can't take criticism? And I'm waiting for him, I'm waiting for him to laugh. I'm thinking, he's pulling my leg. This is a joke. And he wasn't. And that was a learning experience for me because it made me realize that People's behaviors are so ingrained within themselves. This is for them how the world works. So your point about Daniel Dennett is something I'd never ever thought of before, that really he genuinely doesn't see it. And I'm thinking, wow, that is mind-blowingly intriguing and an area for, for research going forward because we all experience the world through the senses that we have and we define our world through our experiences. But if you've never had those experiences, it's like the Saper Wolf hypothesis, isn't it? You know, the idea that language in some way creates the way we think. And could it be our experiences mold the way we see the world and also our inner life as well? 
So I just wanted to make that point now because I was just so enthusiastic about that as well. But I'm very interested. I wrote a book a few years ago called The Labyrinth of Time, which is about time perception and everything else. And I'm particularly interested in Minkowski's idea of block time and also the work of Julian Barber and Julian Barber's idea that time doesn't exist. Now, in your book, you have a whole section on, on block time and it's very central to your developing thesis. So if you can explain exactly how you develop that argument, because it's very, very beguiling and very, very powerful. I'm supposed to remember that? <laughs> <laughs> I, well, let me just say about that time chapter. Uh, um, Julie and I were going to work on a paper about time together. And so that was the first chapter we wrote. And it took the longest to write because we had to actually figure out what we were going to talk about. And, um, and, and what we decided to do was we're going to look at the way in which time is approached in physics, in neuroscience, in phenomenology and altered states of consciousness. And, and to our knowledge, no one had ever tried to do that. Um, and so we I were trying to... Nobody knows. All right. I have to nobody knows, yeah. So there's, there's, uh, there's an effort to sort of bring all these ingredients together that, as you probably feel frustrated, you know, like other people aren't bringing them together. Why aren't they looking at this? Um, uh, the, I think what, one of the things that you're seeing with the physics part of it is that you're seeing the clash that has existed all along between the general theory of relativity and quantum mechanics. And the two theories are, well, I mean, there are people who would say, well, they're not really incompatible, but they really do present quite different versions of the world. And in particular, uh, the general theory is a local theory, and quantum mechanics is non-local. And if you have a local universe in which everything has to bump into everything else, and then you can put the constraints on what the fastest is that anything can go, which is the speed of light, then you can come up with, and you assume that everything is deterministic, that there are no stochastic, genuinely stochastic processes anywhere. Um, then you end up with the block universe. In other words, that everything that's ever going to happen, anything that's ever happened is just, it's all sitting there. And at first when Julia said, you need to read Julian Barbour's theory of time, and she explained it a little bit to me, I said, that's, that's crazy, I'm not reading that. And then in the interests of sort of being conscientious and, and you know, due regard for people's intellectual achievement, I read it, and what do you know? We agree with him. Um, the, the idea that Julian Barbour has is that well, let's just strip events, let's just strip everything away from events so that all we have left are the events themselves. Well, if all we have the events, then where does all this ancillary structure come from? The space, the time, everything like that. Well, that, those, are, those are not necessary. And so he thinks of, of there being a now and another now and another now. And so there's a big pile of nows somewhere and, and we call that um, the pre-physical substrate, or we call that deep time. This also has to do with sort of using Bohm's ideas of implicate explicate order. So it would be the implicate order, not the explicate order, that kind of thing. So there's, there's a realm in which this big pile of now sits. And then for Julian Barbour, well, then they pop out. So now obviously you need a secondary time. So we split time up into apparent time, which is the time that we experience, and deep time, which is whatever this time is of this other realm in which all these nows sit. And so the nows pop out. Well, when a now pops out, the interesting thing about the now is that the, both the past and the future are constructions. They're not, they're not real. In, in apparent time, they're just, they're just sitting there in this now, bracketing it, so to speak. And, and Julian Barbour already makes that point. So, so the idea here is that if you go into this, deep state, 
into the pre-physical substrate, you don't necessarily have to come out with a now that matches what the fictional future was of the now that just popped out a little while ago. Now, it's probably going to, and here's, here's sort of where my theory of meaning feels. Yeah, so we, we I went away from the, we went away from the morphogenetic fields that are in the book, and since then I've sort of developed a theory of meaning fields. That it, it's the meaning fields that hold things in place. Um, and that allow them to sort of, you know, for, for, the, for the right kind of now to come out next, so to speak. But if you tamper with the meaning fields, you get different nows coming up. Now, the idea here is, the, the radical idea here is that because the past is fictional, um, you can also go to a now with a different past. And Julia uh, actually suggested that we write about that as a form of therapy in the book. And I said that there wasn't enough evidence for it, wasn't sufficiently evidence-based at the time that we wrote this to actually present this to our readers, I thought. But, but now you can sort of think of these block universe as being these potential pasts and futures of a now. So, so it's kind of like, this is what could have happened in the past and what can happen in the future and it's all determined. But it doesn't have to be that way because we could go to a now that has a different past and different future. And so it's like you're, you've got a set of sort of block universes and you're just kind of shifting between them. You can kind of like roll between them, so to speak, and disidentify with one and identify with another one, switch yourself into another one. So one of the things that I'm very interested in at this point is how do you do the switching? Like mm -hmm. how, do, how, how can you overcome the power of the meaning fields to hold you in a particular version of these so that you can actually experience a different one, say one in which the cancer doesn't exist. I mean, this is the, an obvious application of it. And I don't think that exactly answers your question, but that's, that kind of gets at like this notion of the block universes, which are, which come out of Einstein's theory. And then, you know, um, Julian Barbour doing a more sort of quantum analysis of this, well, things start to come apart whenever you, start to look at things from the point of view of quantum theory. And, and I should say, like I hear a lot about this clash between um, the general theory of relativity and uh, quantum theories, but I actually sat in on a course at a university close to this. It was a senior graduate applied mathematics course on uh, quantum field theory for cosmology. And there actually are ways that you can you could the two theories become compatible you basically put your quantum fields on curved time on uh, curved space mm -hmm. I mean, curved yeah is is the, the way in which you do that now it's obviously very difficult to do but that's where kind of like the cutting edge of that research is it's not so much is one right the other one wrong but it's more uh can we can we kind of um develop quantum theory on these uh curved manifolds well, one of the problems is, isn't it, that they find if they actually plug in the equations and use the equations in quantum physics that you do in relativity, they end up with infinities. And that has always been a problem they've had. Um, and I'm very intrigued, you know, whether you're doing it on curved space, curved space, because that could be a very interesting way of going forward. I was madly making notes there of, of what you were talking. Lots of things were firing up in my mind. And I was thinking, this is very much an idea of almost an application of Richard Feynman's sum over histories, that every possible path is taken by a subatomic particle to get between A and B, and it's where it ends up, where the person observer, observer observes where it is. So we could argue and take from that, you know, the collapsing of the wave function. You collapse your own personal wave function, which collapses your particular phaneron or worldview that is exclusive to your own. Now, on top of this, you could apply, for instance, um, the transactional analysis of quantum physics. And I can't think who the guy that came up with that. But again, it's very, very similar to um, the, the work that was, that's been done recently on the idea that of multiple universes and applying multiple universes in terms of the implications of black holes. So there's a lot of area here that I really need to talk to you about elsewhere but I'm just taking the opportunity to say there's a lot of interesting themes you're taking there um, in terms of the block universe. Now, 
I'm, I'm aware of time and I, it's just flown by. It's just absolutely incredible. I've just enjoyed, as I expected, this was going to be a f fantastic intellectual discussion. But I'm now interested really in how you've applied that in your, your, your flicker filter theory, because you've now actually built up something from the implications of Julian Barber and Minkowski and everything. You've come up with something quite, quite intriguing in terms of consciousness and perception in terms of that. So for the last 10 minutes or so, maybe we could go into that area. Um, well, this may sound strange, but I don't, I, I, I'm not that, um, um, I'm not, I'm not a particularly strong advocate of my own theories. Okay. <laughs> your hypotheses, your speculations. Yeah. I feel that all theories need to be held lightly, including my own. And it's just a way of trying to sort of throw a sketch on top of how can we think about things? How can things, are, are there ways of thinking about things that can be more helpful, really, is, is a way of thinking about that. And, and this just goes back to what um, I was saying earlier. Um, the, this idea that we really, we're really looking at two levels somehow. We're like looking at the level of what we experience as physical manifestation. Um, and then we're looking at some kind of deep level in which all of this is organized or space and time don't exist in that level. This also comes from studying uh, transcendent states of consciousness a lot and non-duality and what people say when they're in these states and so on and so forth. Um, and it all kind of like, all the pieces kind of fit loosely into sort of thinking about it this way, that, that, that we have uh, the apparent reality here, and then, which it could be some kind of simulation, and then we've got like some kind of deep reality that's actually the machinery or the, or the um, place from which it emerges or from which it, it, it manifests. Um, and the idea then being that if we can switch between, you know, we can switch between potential realities as to how this one unfolds. So it has very sort of profound practical applications in that sense. The one that I mentioned before where Julia Mossbridge said there are techniques, you know, that, that some therapists are apparently using where they will change your past or they're trying to change your past. Mm -hmm. You have the traumatic past you have, you have a different Can that really happen? Um, and, and according to this model, well, yes. <laughs> according to sort of more conventional model, well, no. Um, but there is something actually in, that led me to this as well, and that was looking at non-locality, not just spatial non-locality, but there's also temporal non-locality. So there mm -hmm. are in conventional physics, there are um, events in the past that are incomplete but they're matched to events that occur in the future or in the now. And so as you approach those events now and you resolve them, now they get resolved in the past. So even in that very minimal sense, see the past is not, is incomplete in some versions of quantum theory. So you're, you're completing the past by the choices that you make now. So, so that kind of, made me perhaps more um, sympathetic to Julian Barbour's idea that, well, you just replace the entire thing. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say about these models and their applications, I, th I, think, I think one of the, one of the other things that I was, this was uh, reading a, uh, one of the chapters in Stephen Browdy's book, um, The Gold Leaf Lady. I don't know if you read the book. Yeah, great right. book. Wonderful. Yeah. When he starts talking about later on in the book, and he, he points out that it's very important to you know, check your assumptions, the assumptions that you're making about things. And, and then a couple of pages later, I noticed that he assumed that somehow the universe is mechanical and that all meaning stemmed from humans. That, that you cannot, that there is no meaning in nature. We're the meaning makers. And then I thought, well, wait a minute. He just said, check your assumptions. So let's just check this assumption. Are we the only meaning makers? 
And what if you challenge that? What if you say, well, maybe we're not? Maybe nature also has meaning. Maybe nature knows, maybe nature knows what belongs to someone's experiment and what doesn't. And so I came up with this idea that these are meaning fields, that they, that they hold the pattern for what it is that happens physically um, in a way that delimits what happens. And, and so this is what we're, and this is similar to uh, Rupert Sheldrake's notion of, notion of morphogenetic fields. Mm -hmm. but, but one of the criticisms of his theory has been that he didn't go far enough. Like it's still a mechanical theory. And when you look at it as a mechanical theory, it doesn't work. And it can't, it, there are certain experiments it can't explain. Like Bill Bankston's healing experiments, uh, quantum eraser experiments and so on. But so, so I came up with a way of thinking about it that can also help to resolve those kinds of experiments. And that is to extend meaning to those fields and to say, well, the fields actually carry meaning with them and they can make judgments. The fields can make judgments, which are similar to the judgments that we make. So, so that in effect, you're, you're restoring this kind of vitality and intelligence to nature that we've stripped away from it. It's kind of, it's kind of a logical step. Like if you go, okay, you know, it, you know, we decided that, you know, we decided that the world was a material place, which by the way, Gassendi was a Catholic priest and he never intended materialism to be the only explanation of reality. He was a practicing Catholic priest who, who believed in his faith. So he never threw out everything else. It was just people came coming along later, threw out all, all of what, you know, the vestiges of religion and so on. I said, okay, this is it. This is all we've got is these molecules. They're bumping. That's it. That doesn't work. So, uh, so now we say, you know, as David Chalmers sort of sticks it in the face of philosophers, you've got to deal with quality, you've got to deal with quality, here they are. And then, then how long is it going to take before we say, well, wait a minute, why should it only be here? Maybe it pervades everything. And actually, there's a wonderful quote from Christoph Kolb who's a very famous neuroscientist, uh, where he says that. He says, I have, I have a sense that everything, everything, meaning is everywhere in the universe. I don't know where it comes from, he says. It's just an intuition I have. So this is a way of sort of saying, okay, well, let's, let's put meaning back in nature as well. And, and one way of doing that is to sort of capture it with this idea of meaning fields. There will be a paper coming out in, in the September issue of Edge Science, it's very readable about the theory of meaning fields. Um, yeah. Because it's very much, isn't it? You know, you, you, you name checked earlier on David Bohm. And when you were saying that, I was thinking this is Bohm's implicate and explicate orders writ large. You know, it's, it's the idea of there is some kind of field behind everything. Um, and I contributed a chapter to a book that came out uh, around about two years ago called Pandeism. An anthology, and of course, that's the idea in, in within pandeism rather than uh, panandeism. You know, the idea that there is that consciousness is everything, and, and somehow we are emanations of that. In which case, the communication can be immediate. And if we take a holographic worldview, and the idea of this is some form of holographic nature, and you mentioned and you touched upon non-locality, and the idea of the the implications of the EPR paradox and everything else, and the work of um, uh, uh, the guy, the French guy that did the Alain Aspe, Alain Aspe and his work. Clearly, yeah. this is the direction we need to be moving now collectively to say, well, you know, if consciousness, we know consciousness exists, so where is it? Where is it manifest? Again, I wrote a book with Irvin Laszlo a few years ago, and we touched upon a lot of these elements and a lot of the leading edge science here. So there is so much that we still have to talk about, and I'm really looking forward now to, to ch talking with Julia about her aspects, but I think we've only scratched the surface here. I think we need to do this again, and it would be nice to do it with your group behind you as well and maybe include them in some form of discussions on a future show, because we have been discussing this of having some kind of more broader dynamic 
to really get these ideas out because I'm so excited about these. So very quickly, how do people contact you? What, what you, any contact things you have in terms of um, anybody watching this program? I would say this guy's got some very interesting ideas. How do I contact him? How do I look at his papers and everything else? Because I know they're all there and you can download them for free off your site, which is brilliant. Uh, just go to my website, uh, barusss.ca. Excellent. Good. Well, thank you so much. The hour has just gone like that. There were, there were so many other areas I wanted to go into, but the things you were saying were so intriguing that I never even got the chance to talk about them. But one of the things, when I was going through the book... Get to the I was, student question. <laughs> I'm sorry? We didn't even get to the student questions. No, we didn't. That's why we need to probably do a longer program. But I was going through a list of the people that, that you name check. And there's so many people that I actually know from Bill Guggenheim to Bernard Haish to, uh, I don't know, Vernon Nepe. You know, there's just so many areas. We've been obviously furrowing the same track in parallel for yeah. quite a few years. And I think it's going to be interesting to probably spend some time discussing areas of mutual interest. Benny Shannon. I'm a huge fan of Benny Shannon. Ayahuasca, the implications of DMT and the pineal gland and everything as well. So there's lots of great areas there. So thank you very much uh, for giving a really inspiring show. And thanks to everybody behind for being incredibly quiet. Um, I wasn't expecting that, but thank you for that. Um, but if you guys are all interested in trying to get something together to do this and using Zoom in a more, a more dynamic way, let's do it. Um, let's maybe early next year, but let's see if we can get together and do that. Okay, okay. thank you very much. Cheers. Thank, thank you. So much. you.